So good morning from California. My name is Ronit Glickman, and I serve on the board of the International Dyslexia Association, Northern California branch, and I will be your host this morning. We are so happy to offer you this free webinar. The International Dyslexia Association is dedicated to helping individuals with dyslexia, and we provide essential evidence-based research information and resources to families and educators. To increase public awareness, we host webinars, dyslexia simulation workshops, and teacher trainings. For more information about IDA, please visit our website. Also, please consider becoming a member of our IDA community. First year's membership is free for all teachers. I will add a link in the chat. Um, please consider becoming a member today. Now, it is with great pleasure I have the opportunity to introduce the author of Beneath the Surface of Words, Sue Shabetta Heglin. Sue is an educator, author, and frequent speaker on topics related to spelling. She began her career doing research in instructional design, but her focus shifted in 2003 when she learned that one of her children is dyslexic. Trained in the Orton-Gillingham approach to literacy instruction, she has been studying and teaching about orthographic linguistics since 2014. Sue has served on the board of directors for the Upper Midwest branch of the International Dyslexia Association, on the Board of Education for the Brandon Valley School District, and she is currently the Editor-in-Chief for the International Dyslexia Association's Fact Sheet Publications, and she is the founder of the website learningaboutspelling.com, and I will add her website link in the chat. Uh, I recommend bookmarking it. There's lots of resources there. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Sue Shabetta Heglin. Thank you so much, Ronit. Um, really, I appreciate the, that nice introduction and I, I'm really glad to be here with you all today. So we're gonna be talking today about the topic of morphological awareness. I, I'm really happy that Ronit didn't make me give her a title for this because I didn't really settle on this title until even just a couple of days ago. And it actually was even, I was tweaking it even last night because what I wanna to talk to you about is morphological awareness and particularly how it applies to literacy instruction because we don't always talk about morphological awareness that way. And I think what we're gonna hopefully be able to talk about today is how powerful and helpful it can be for students and for literacy when we look at morphological awareness as it pertains to written language. So here, let me get my slides moving here. So here's the um, here's our, our main topic for today. We're going to talk about morphological awareness, and we'll start by talking about morphology, because morphological awareness is about being aware of morphology and the important role that morphology has in English. So we'll start there. We'll talk a little bit about what that means. Then we will define and discuss morphological awareness, and we're going to contrast it with what I'm calling morphemic knowledge or the knowledge of specific morphemes, because those are different things. And sometimes we can get caught up in the specifics of the details and miss the big picture that's so important in terms of what we wanna help kids really know. And then we'll wrap up with a way of thinking about possibly teaching and developing morphological awareness in students, particularly as it pertains to written language, because if that's what we're trying to get at with, with literacy instruction is help children understand how to read and how to spell and use written language uh, with an understanding of how it actually works. So before we get started talking about morphology, I just want to establish some common ground. So I'm going to assume that we are agreed that when students begin learning to read and spell, they need to be taught explicitly and systematically about the relationships between the pronunciation of spoken words and their spelling. So for example, 
Let's see here. I don't know why sometimes my slides don't like to move. Okay, so for example, in order to read and spell a word like send, students need to learn that that spoken word send can be analyzed into smaller segments of the pronunciation. And those are called phonemes. So in send, the phonemes, the individual sounds would be the s, e, n, d that we are probably familiar with. And we can represent those phonemes, as you see here, using either phonic symbols, as I've done on the top, or IPA symbols. IPA symbols are symbols of the International Phonetic Association. So, and by the way, I've got the slash brackets here. Slash brackets tell us that when we see, say, an S, we're not talking about the letter S, we're talking about the pronunciation S. So that's important. It's an essential part of early instruction. It needs to be really explicitly taught to students. But the reason it's important is because we then need to be able to show them how those phonemes show up in written words. We want them to understand the written word, S-E-N-D, and what those graphemes, those letters or combinations of letters are representing. And the angle brackets are telling us now we're talking about a spelling. So students need to develop an awareness of the phonemes in words, but they don't need that to speak. They they can speak and listen and understand just fine without being able to pull apart those phonemes, but we know that it's very important when they try to spell a word. Um, and over time, then, students need to learn about all the possible relationships between phonemes and graphemes. So we have e eh here spelled with an e, but we know that we can also spell it with an ea, and so students need to learn all of that. And then we talk about usually that aspect of literacy instruction as phonics, and it's super important. We need to do that, but we also know that those relationships can be complicated. So it, that process of identifying the phonemes in a word and then saying, okay, now I'm going to write a graphene. You know, I'm going to write, I'm going to S-E-N-D. That works great for many words in English. And some students have to work really hard to be able to do that isolation. But once they get to the point where they can do that, and then they can, they understand some of the most common ways to spell those phonemes, they can spell words pretty accurately. But with other words, it's not so easy. Right with words like says or does, if students are saying s, e, z, d, a, z, they're not going to get to the spelling. Uh, they end up then having to memorize at least part of those words, and that can be very difficult, very time consuming, very frustrating for many students. And then the thing is, as we get into longer words, we get even more of this, more challenges. So when we look at these words, president, precedent, decadent, we have representations of the fact that we often have more than one way to spell a phoneme. So in president, there's a z, but it's spelled with an s. Why with an s? Why not with a z? In precedent, we have that s, but it's not spelled with an s here, it's spelled with a c. And then in all three of these words, we have a medial vowel. We have that vowel in the middle, the i in president, the e in precedent, the a in decadent, that are really articulated in just natural speech, pretty much the same. President, precedent, pre president, precedent, decadent. Tongue twisters I gave myself there. But you can see that that little, that vowel in the middle is, is known as a schwa in terms of its articulation. You probably heard people talk about the schwa. And that is a neutral pronunciation that is very hard to connect to a particular spelling when all you're working with is that pronunciation. So we need more than just pronunciation to understand the spelling of many words, and this is where morphology comes in. So let's, let's make sure we're using the same terminology as we start to talk about morphology, because not everyone uses the same words, the same terms. I'm going to use certain terms that I'll share with you, and I'm going to use this definition of morphology. Morphology is the study of the structures in words that contribute to the meaning of those words. And those structures we know as morphemes. Now, as you look at this definition, you'll, you'll see it, if you've looked at definitions of morphology, if you're familiar with morphology, it's very similar to what you may have seen, but there's a slight difference, and I think it's really important as we think about written language. So what I've got here is that those are the, morphology is the study of the structures and words, the morphemes, and those morphemes are things that contribute to the meaning of those words, rather than have meaning or carry meaning. 
And there's a reason that I've made this, this kind of slight distinction, and it has particularly to do with what we'll notice going on in written language. Because if we think about morphemes having meaning, we start to run into problems. But this is going to allow us to really understand morphology of written language and, and apply it to literacy. So let's take a look then at some examples of morphemes of these structural units that contribute to the meaning of words. Then we're gonna use what's called a word matrix. So here's a matrix that shows us written morphemes inside those various cells. So the TEND, the DIS, um, the AT, those would be considered written morphemes. And we can talk about morphemes in both spoken language and written language. And so the term element is a really useful term because if you say I'm talking about a base element, you're talking about a written form, say, rather than just talking about a morpheme in its more general sense, because that's actually kind of a conceptual um, idea. It's, a, it's a, an abstract term. And we can talk about the representation of morphemes in written language as well as in spoken language. So the term element is useful because now we're talking about spelling. So um, we have a written morpheme in the center of this matrix and it's spelled T-E-N-D and that is a base element. And some people will talk about a base word or a root, but I really like this term base element because now we know we're talking about morphology, we're talking about spelling. Every word has at least one base as its foundation. So in every matrix, there's gonna be a base in that central banner. And this base happens to be a free base. I have free in parentheses there because you always have a base element. Sometimes they're free, sometimes they're bound. This one is free, which means that we have a word where if we take that base, T-E-N-D, it is going to form a word all by itself, the word tend. So we might say, I tend to skip breakfast most days. We have another base element in this matrix, B-A-R. And when we have more than one base in a matrix, it means that we can create compound words. So we could create here the, the compound word bartend from those two elements. We also then are going to have prefixes to the left of the base and suffixes to the right of the base. And not every matrix has all of these components. And then finally, we have what's called an orthographic denotation. And that is the word in quotation marks underneath the base. And here, the, the orthographic denotation of this base, T-E-N-D, is stretch. Now, notice this is not the same thing as the meaning of the word tend. If I say I tend to skip breakfast, it doesn't mean I stretch to skip breakfast, right? That's not the meaning of the word. The meaning is different and has come into English and often meanings of words change over time. Um, but, what, what, but the reason this orthographic denotation is so useful is that that deep we're going to call it a sense and meaning or a nugget of meaning or an echo of meaning is in that base element. The, the term orthographic denotation is kind of a mouthful, but it's a really nice term because orthographic, we're definitely talking about the spelling and denotation, which is a synonym for meaning, but we're talking about that deep sense that's carried in the base. Not the same thing as the meaning of a word or even any word that has that orthographic denotation. But you can notice that many words in this matrix are going to have some connection to that idea of stretch. If you think of distended, I had a huge helping a pasta last night. My stomach was a little distended, right? A little stretched. My pants got distended too. So that has this idea of stretch built into it. But if you think about a word like intend, it might not seem quite like stretch, but it actually historically, that's where that word came from. And you can think about the idea of trying when you intend to do something, you're kind of stretching yourself a little bit, right? You're going to do something maybe a little bit different or make something happen that might be a bit of a stretch. So it's it's literally, we, we often can perceive that connection without even knowing it. And when you see this orthographic denotation, you'll be able to sense that connection, but it's not the same thing at a meeting as the meaning, and that's really important. So the orthographic denotation is determined by looking at the meaning of etymons that this the words say that contain that base have, have come from. But again, it's the, the, the meaning of the etymon and the meaning of the words in English are not the same. They're different. 
but that deep sense has kind of come with the base. So I'm going to um, really encourage you to think about the difference between an orthographic denotation and a meaning, and, and maybe even get away from saying that morphemes have meaning, because as we will talk as we go further, that can really kind of limit our way ability to understand and use morphology. So as we look at a matrix, then we're looking at kind of a static representation of morphology. We can see prefixes, we can see suffixes, but there's also a way to show the process of building written words from written elements, and that's a word sum. So here we see word sums for the words distended, attend, and tend. So we've got DIS plus TEND plus ED is rewritten as DIS, TEND, ED, and that gives us the word distended. So it shows how we synthesize or construct the spelling of words using these written elements. We can also, so that's called a synthetic word sum because we're synthesizing it. We can also create analytic word sums. So we can take a completed word and then analyze it into individual elements that build it, as we see here for the words intending and intends and attends. Now, I want you to notice how I pronounce the base T-E-N-D, in the word intending, intending. If you were to try to sort of sound that out, you feel the D, intending, intend. But what happens when I say intends or attends? Someone intends to come, they attend, they, 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 uh, she attends this get together every year. If I were to say, let's count it out intends, or she's intends to be there, for me, that pronunciation is identical. The d that we can feel in the base when it's by itself, tend, intend, is not going to be felt when we add that suffix and pronounce it. And that happens a lot in spoken language. When we speak words, the phonemes that we're trying to identify in those spoken words are often overlapping or merging with the phoneme that comes before the phoneme comes after it. And that process has a name, it's called co-articulation. So as a result of co-articulation, when we pronounce a word or when a student tries to pronounce a word, sometimes phonemes just seem to disappear completely. They may feel different, they may, they may sound or, or feel different to us, and sometimes we can't even perceive them at all. So, if I were to try to spell these words the way I pronounce them, I might write something like this. So if we look at a tens on the bottom, A-T-T-E-N-D-S, we have to say, well, we can feel the t in that word, but we can't necessarily feel that we need two t's. How do we know that we need two t's? This is where morphology comes in, because the only way to know that we need two of them is to know that there's a, a, a T in the prefix, the AT, that's actually an assimilated form of AD. And in Latin, attending to something meant to tend to it. And that AD, AT was a preposition in Latin that had this idea of to do something or to. So it was a compound in Latin. It made its way into English. And we still have that idea that if we're tending to something, we're tending to it. Makes sense, right? So we would know that we have two T's only because we can look at the structure. And as we're learning to spell that, we want to pay attention to that structure so that we can be reminded, oh, yeah, that's right. Because otherwise, students are going to think, uh, well, what about about or you know, again, or amaze, or adapt, or above, where there's only one consonant that comes after it. And sometimes we'll, we'll think, well, maybe it has to do with the pronunciation, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, so the other thing to notice here with my, I guess, attempt to represent my pronunciation with spelling, with I-N-T-E-N-S, is does that look like it could be another word entirely? with maybe a little missing letter at the end there, right? To me, it looks like intense and somebody forgot to write the E. So one of the things to know about morphology is the one of the reasons we write each and every letter in a base, in a prefix, in a suffix, even though the pronunciation changes all the time, is because when we look at it in written form, we are instantly able to identify it and know what the word is. So when we see I-N-T-E-N-D-S, 
we know, oh, that's intend with the suffix s. And our brains process a final s so quickly as a suffix, it's amazing. There are actually some conventions in English spelling that help kind of override that when that's not what's happening because we are attuned to seeing what that word is and the, the consistent spelling of an element is what helps us do it. Sometimes the pronunciation doesn't get us there, but we can usually go from the spelling to understand the connection to the pronunciation. So we're going to notice as we start looking for it that written elements, base elements, prefixes, and suffixes are going to maintain their spelling as we add and remove affixes, even when their pronunciation changes somewhat. And you've probably, if you've ever seen me present, you've seen this because I can't ever resist adding, throwing it in there, but we see it with the word says. And I still see teachers thinking, how can I help kids memorize says when what is really most powerful is to say, oh, look, it's say, S-A-Y. Kids learn that A-Y right away. They learn the most common pronunciation of it. And in say, S-A-Y, it's not a mystery. And look, we add an S because it's I says, he says. I walk, she walks, I run, he runs. We add a suffix to all of those words and that's how we spell it. We build it with the base and the suffix. So we're often surprised by the pronunciation of says, but note that it's not an irregular spelling if we look at the structures in the word. It's only irregular if we're trying to go from a complex word with more than one morpheme and understand the pronunciation, ignoring the fact that sometimes that pronunciation will shift. All right, so that is a little bit about morphology, but how does that connect to morphological awareness? So I'm gonna give you a definition of morphological awareness that's used a lot. This is, and here it is. Morphological awareness is the ability to reflect on and manipulate morphemes. In other words, the ability to analyze words into smaller meaningful parts such as prefixes, Roots, and this, a lot of time roots are used as I'm using the term base. So I would say prefixes, bases, and suffixes. So we need to be able to analyze words into those smaller meaningful parts. And that matters a lot for literacy. So here's another quote. This comes from a research study. And there they, they mention the idea of what morphological awareness is. They say morphological awareness, which is an understanding of how words can be broken down into smaller units of meaning, such as roots or bases, prefixes and suffixes, has emerged as an important contributor to word reading and comprehension skills. Now, this study doesn't even talk about spelling. And that's how I first got interested in morphology, because it's so powerful for spelling. But it's it's also very important for reading and comprehension. And they go on to say that it has been found to play a significant role in reading comprehension after controlling for phonological awareness and word decoding skills in children. So take a group of children who have the two groups of children who have the same level of phonological awareness, same level of decoding. That's what we're putting most of our energy into often. Those two groups of students, if one of them has better morphological awareness, they're going to have better reading comprehension. So it has power for literacy. And it's something we can develop as we go along. It's not something we have to set aside until later. In fact, we don't want to do that. So that's a brief definition of morphological awareness. We'll come back and talk more about that as we go on. But I want to show you a little bit about more about morphology and how helpful it can be. And I want to point out that spelling errors themselves often help develop our own morphology more own morphological awareness, our understanding of how morphemes are operating in written English. Because when we see a spelling error, and especially when we can't explain it, that's usually when I get excited because I'm like, wow, I can see why you spelled it that way. It's spelled this way. I wonder why, because I have a really good memory for spelling. I've always been able to just remember the spelling of words. And it's often my students who make me realize, oh, you know what? I must've just memorized that one because I don't really think it makes sense when I try to do what I've just asked my students to do. So here's an, an error that actually it turns out my son, Ronit mentioned my um, oldest son is dyslexic and he made this error a couple of years ago when we were playing a game and he wrote down the word president, but he spelled it with an E instead of an I. And huh, that seems reasonable based on his pronunciation, how could he know that it's actually with an I without having to memorize it, but be able, he's a mechanical engineer now, right? I want him to be able to 
assemble it. I wanted him to be able to put it back together. So what he had to know is that the word president is related to the word preside. In fact, historically, a president was someone who presided over something, presided over a meeting. And presiding over a meeting actually meant sitting at the front of the meeting. So both of these words share a base, S-I-D-E. So we build preside with P-R-E, S-I-D-E, put them together. We build president by then adding an E-N-T suffix to that word preside. And that slash mark there is an indication that we replace that final E when we add the vowel suffix that follows. So many of you probably know the E convention, the doubling convention, the Y to I convention. We apply these very often in, in uh, assembling or, or synthesizing long words, and we may actually use those conventions more than once. So once you know that president is related to preside, now we've got that I in preside that's more clear, that S-I-D-E, that that syllable is stressed. And so we can understand, oh yeah, president, it's, I can't really tell what that vowel is, but it's related to preside and there I've got the vowel. So when we put these words together, we can, um, we can make more sense of them. So here is then a matrix for that base S-I-D-E. And notice it has an orthographic denotation of sit or settle. That comes from its history. All of these words are built from that same base. And I'll give you just a minute to look through those. I'll take a sip of water. So they, they all come from this Latin etymon, sedere, that meant to settle or sit. And if you think about these words, again, the orthographic denotation is not the same thing as the meaning of these words, but there's a connection. So if you think about something subsiding, right, it's sort of settling down or the residue that's left after I drank some kombucha and there's some residue in the bottom of the bottle. And all of these others presiding was sitting at the front of the room, that PRE that we often see in like preview or, or um, preschool has this idea of before or front. So all of these words have come from that same origin. And sometimes that sense of sitting or settling is very close. Sometimes it's more distant, a dissident by the way, D-I-S apart. So a dissident was someone who sat apart. And you can still think of that metaphorically, right? If you're a dissident, you're setting apart, sitting apart from the opinions of other people or the way other people are looking at things. So this is a bound base. And that means that there's no English word that consists of just this base. If it's bound, that it always has another element attached to it when it forms a word. So in subside, we have that SUB, in preside, we have the PRE. But you might be thinking, wait a minute, I know a word, S-I-D-E, but that is a different base. So here is that base, S-I-D-E, like I'm on the side of the 49ers tomorrow, um, S-I-D-E with the idea of flanks, long part. And that's a pretty remote orthographic denotation for many of our uses of S-I-D-E today in sidewalk or sideway, you know, that's that doesn't connect for us very much. But sometimes it does. If we say, you know, the word, whenever I hear the word flanks, I think of horses. So if you talk about leaning against the side of a horse, leaning against the flanks of a horse, you can kind of see that origin. But again, the sense has really evolved. But what we have here that's important to know is that we have what are called homographic base elements, homographic, same, G-R-A-P-H, writing, same spelling, but they are not the same base. And the only way to know that is to look at the etymology of some of the words that these have come from. And then you can say, oh, I see there are two different bases. And the way we find out which words belong in which matrix is also to look at etymology. Now, remember, right here, I'm giving you morphemic knowledge. I'm telling you about two bases that you may not have known about. Don't be concerned that you would have to know this base or that base in order to be able to help students understand morphology. I'm talking to giving you these examples. You might work with a student someday and use two completely different examples. The idea though is what's important, that base elements have this orthographic denotation. They can be free or bound, 
And the way we know about that is we look at the etymology, which we may not do today, right? And they can be homographic. They can have the same spelling, but have different senses. And I see this being kind of missed a lot. And it's so powerful if we can begin to understand how to use it. All right, so let's go back to this bound base SID. And notice we, I already showed you prefixes and suffixes in a matrix. We also have here what's called a connecting vowel letter. That connecting vowel letter I shows up in the spelling of the word presidential. So we have a bound base SIDE. It's combined with a prefix to make a verb, preside. We add another suffix to get a noun, president. And then we add an al suffix to get an adjective. We might say she has real presidential bearing, right? We make it an adjective. But in between that, that second to last suffix and the final suffix, there's this I. It's connecting valid. It's in the spelling having come in from Latin. It's become part of its, its spelling because of where it came from. But in English today, we can analyze that as a completely coherent structural element. So this is one of the reasons that that definition of a morpheme as contributing to the meaning of words or helping us construct the meaning of words, that's super important as we talk about written language because that I doesn't have any meaning. It doesn't carry any meaning. It may sometimes affect pronunciation a little bit, but sometimes it doesn't. And what it really is that is most coherent is it's a structural component of the construction of words. And so we treat that as a morpheme as we're talking about written morphology. All right, so I'm gonna share with you then here, one of my students wrote the word presidential like this. Now, if you try to pronounce that word that she wrote, she was pretty close, right? I mean, there were a few things. She's got some phonemic awareness issues that we would need to deal with or some issues around voicing that might be worth talking about. But when we get to presidential, you know, she's, she's trying to spell what she feels or hears. What we have to be able to do is show the structure of the word in order for her to understand it. And once you do, it is so logical. Our future engineers, our future scientists are going to love this because it makes so much sense. If all we have to work with is, president, is, is pronunciation, then students are inevitably going to make these kinds of spelling errors. And why isn't preside, preside spelled with a Z after all? But once students begin to look at written words as constructions that work from these meaningful, meaning bearing, meaning contributing, that really don't have meaning elements, and we put them together in logical ways, they're going to be able to understand it. And by the way, these elements are going to repeat in all kinds of different words, spelled the same, often doing exactly the same job. So students still need phonemic awareness. They still need to know about phoneme graphing relationships. But what I really love is how a morphological family, a family of words like this that's built on a base, we can use those phoneme graphing relationships to understand all of those letters that are sort of not articulated as clearly in one word or another. So in preside, that first E is a little bit murky, but in president, it's stressed. And so we can say, oh, there's a short E there. When we get to president, we've got that I that's not really articulated, but if we look back at preside, we've got the, the I to work with. And when we get to presidential, the stress shifts to that ENT. So now we understand why that's there. So often this is the case where as pronunciation shifts, as we add and remove suffixes and prefixes, we get different parts of the word that are stressed where that phoneme graphene relationship is so clear and just jumps right out at us. So we can help kids understand why there's an I, why there's an E using phoneme graphene relationships, but it has to be in the context of all of these words because any one of them doesn't give us everything we need. We still though don't know about why we're spelling Z with an S because in preside and president, presidential, it's always a Z. So this is where the power of the bound base 
element comes in. And I think it's really worth noting that not everyone you will talk with or hear talking about morphology will recognize bound base elements as an important part of morphology. And one of the reasons is that, that we're, we're all learning more about morphology. I'm trying to learn more about it. I'm reading books on morphology. But when we look at those books written on morphology, they're usually written by linguists who are really focusing on spoken language. And so linguists, I'm going to show you this. For, for linguists, the top word here is often considered to be the minimal distinctive unit of meaning. So if we look at subside and dissident and residue, you can completely understand why a linguist who's thinking about spoken language is going to say there's nothing deeper than that because there's, we don't sense a connection in the meaning of those words. If it's the minimal distinctive unit of meaning, there's diff, there are different things going on with those different words. But, I'm just, let me see if I've got some notes here. I wanna make sure I wanna, uh, don't not forget to say something because I think I'm really wanting to emphasize this point to you because I think it's really important. Um, oh, the other thing I was going to say, I guess, is that we need to remember too that there are linguists who would argue that phonemes don't even exist. In linguistics, there's a lot of discussion about theoretical stuff. They're talking about how languages work, how how you know English compares to French, compares to Chinese, compares to all kinds of different languages. So phonemes are this conceptual idea, but we know in education that they're super, super important for kids who need to learn to read and spell. And the same thing is true for a bound base element. A bound Understanding about a bound base is essential if we really want to help students spell and comprehend and develop their vocabulary. Because if we look at words only like this, there's no way to understand why we have an S in president or resident. But when we go to this base, now we see, okay, in preside, residue, reside, I've got zzz, but look in subside, dissident, insidious, now I've got s. And we want kids to learn that an S can be pronounced as z or s, and actually a couple other ways too. And it's really nice to use a family like this this might be for older students, but you have similar things with just cats and dogs, where we can show kids that because the spelling is staying the same, in order for us to understand what the word is, to spot that suffix S at the end, to spot that S-I-D-E that has a certain function in the language, then it's really helpful that we can pronounce that S in more than one way because our pronunciation changes based on what's going on in the phonemes around it. So even though we want to understand the relationships between spoken language and written language, if we start with spoken language and then try to translate it to written language, sometimes we get a little confused because there's so many different things going on in spoken language. Spoken language and written language are connected. We write words, then we read them, we, we say something, and then we want to write it down, but there are different structures and different patterns in them. And so when we're looking at written words, a written bound base element is super important to see. And as you see here, it's so coherent. It makes so much sense. We can spell words without struggle when we understand these elements and include the bound base element in what we teach kids about. Um, so let's talk finally then a little bit about vocabulary and how this idea of a base element, a bound base, a free base, the orthographic denotation of a base in general is helpful. So what's the difference between residing somewhere and living somewhere? Right, right? We want kids to learn. Well, residing is a little higher register, right? It's a little more academic, but there are actually some differences. So the primary definition in my dictionary of reside is to have one's permanent home in a particular place. So that definition of permanent home is, it, you know, it's about settling somewhere. Maybe it, these days it might not be forever, but that's where you've settled. And here again, that orthographic denotation creates the connection. Living is a little different, right? I might want to, I would love actually to live in Italy for a year. 
but I will probably never become a resident of Italy because that implies something much more permanent and I would have settled there. So the orthographic denotation, this is just one example, but they can often give us this lovely sort of thread that helps us understand the difference between this synonym or that synonym. So it's it's this the orthographic denotation then is not the same thing of a meaning as the meaning of a word, but it becomes an anchor that we can anchor those meanings, those many meanings of words, different words, but also sometimes multiple meanings of the same word and understand those subtle differences. And this can be super powerful for students who don't have a lot of vocabulary already. So whether they're a student that's not reading a lot, they're dyslexic, they're struggling, and they haven't had exposure to language, because you might kind of get that idea of, oh, a resident is different than someone who's living there, but you probably picked it up because you've read a lot. A student who hasn't read a lot, a student who's coming in as a second language learner, this can be such a powerful way to help them um, learn more about uh, particular definitions. And I'm going to look at do the same thing here with this word insidious, because that's really an interesting one, I think, when you think about um, the idea of sitting or settling. So the definition here, again, in my dictionary is, and I've got it a little too small here, is proceeding in a gradual, subtle way, but with harmful effects. So some diseases, for example, are insidious and sometimes without symptoms. So think about that and the idea of sitting or settling. So if it's an insidious disease, maybe it sort of settles into place before we even have a chance to figure out what's going on. If someone is treacherous or crafty, huh, what does that have to do with sitting or settling? And again, the history will really help us understand how we got there. So what we see here is that it, this, this is a brief um, sense of the etymology. It doesn't include all parts of it, but ultimately this came into English or, or is first attested around the mid 16th century. Um, it actually came through French, but it was then from Latin insidiosus, which meant cunning, came from another Latin word that meant an ambush or a trick. Before that, it meant in lie and wait for. And then in Latin, that insidere was a compound of on and sit or in that, that um, I and also had the sense of in in Latin. So think about in Latin, we have a word sit, we have a word sit in or on. We put that together, we're sitting in somewhere. Oh, we're lying in wait for someone. Now we get a little bit negative. We're gonna ambush them. We're gonna trick them. And, and then cunning, treacherous. Treacherous was in the French word. And that came into English. So we can kind of see that thread, but it's, again, it's really important to emphasize that the, the, there's the, the base element itself with sit or settle does not mean the same thing as the words that are built from it, but it's this incredible anchor for helping us develop and understand words more deeply. I can I could give you example after example. I had a couple more in here and I cut them out because I always spend too long talking and I wanna have time for questions at the end. But this idea of using the orthographic denotation to anchor learning is really important. So learning bound base elements as separate elements in written language, is extremely productive for literacy. So what we care about what is how do we help students learn to spell? How do we help them learn to read, to comprehend? How do we expand their vocabulary? And linguists can you know, debate this. It's, I'm comfortable with that. I learn from those. I actually learn from reading what linguists have to say about morphology and thinking, okay, how would that apply to spelling? How would that apply to what we're doing with students? It's important because they are scientists thinking about language, but they're not always thinking about written language. And we need to keep that in mind. So I'm going to come back now to this idea of morphological awareness. So this, it's important to recognize that this is an educational term, this idea of morphological awareness. It's not a linguistic term. It's something that talks about the awareness, the understanding of how morphology works in English. And we're particularly focused on written English. So that's what we're looking at today. But it's, we know that the research has shown us that it's really important. So this is from Louisa Mote's um, most recent edition of Speech to Print, where she wrote, Recent research, this was in 2020, research, recent research indicates that morphological awareness is associated with reading and spelling growth from first grade onward in parallel with phoneme awareness and general print knowledge. 
And, you know, there's often concern about, well, if we're going to bring morphology in right away, are we going to displace other things that are super important? So I know people are often very nervous about that. But what the research is saying is that this is all connected. And if we can find ways to connect it without giving up the important things that we want to do, we're going to be helping our students more. She goes on to say, with systematic teaching, morphological awareness develops in tandem with both phonological and orthographic awareness beginning in first grade. And Marsha Henry has says has been saying this for, I heard her talk recently, more than 60 years, she's been talking about and studying morphology and trying to get us more focused on it. Um, and she wrote in 2019, in the past 35 years, especially the current decade, research in the area of morphology has continued to evolve. And we wanna evolve our practices as research and science evolves. She said, the work of many researchers and educators illustrates the need to introduce morphology, which was once thought to be useful only in the upper elementary and secondary grades in the early grades. And so it's, it's true that we know that morphology is extremely powerful when we start getting into academic language in you know, third grade, fourth grade, into high school, and actually throughout life, this is really important. We're gonna keep developing our morphemic knowledge, the things we know and understand about particular morphemes. But what's really important to do as an educator is to sort of step into morphology, step into developing morphological awareness. That is really the aha. That's the students being able to say, oh, I get it. It's like Legos. We put words together. We build these little structures with phonemes and you know they, they have phonemes in the spoken word, they have graphemes in the written word, and then we put them together in really logical ways. That is what you or I as a teacher, as a tutor are gonna wanna do with students. The second step, which kind of starts right away, but then continues on and on and on is building specific knowledge. But one of the reasons I like to make this distinction is I always like to bring something that I hope is gonna make people say, wow, aha, that's interesting. But I worry sometimes that then they'll say, but I didn't know that. How am I supposed to help my kids if I don't know that piece of information or I don't know that piece of information? And so what I really wanted to do today was say, it's not about the specific knowledge that you have that you are going to be bringing to your class or your student or your child, if you're a parent, whatever. It's about understanding how the system works because you might end up with 10 great examples that you can bring in, you know, in, in starting in the beginning of the year, and then you keep coming back to it so that this becomes part of kids thinking from the beginning. You can integrate it into everything you do. And a lot of times when I give talks, I'll just randomly pick a spelling list or a list of vocabulary words or the, the words we think of as irregular, the misunderstood words, the mysterious words, those are great. And maybe you have, you have just your own little kind of toolkit of you bring these out when you can, but you want to help kids understand these concepts. And I pulled to get this together into, this is not all that you might want to teach, but I've got six specific concepts that you might want to be keeping in mind as you are working with students. By the way, I'm just going to mention, I'm not sharing these slides because as you see, the slides are kind of just bare bones, I guess. What I'm going to be doing, though, is I'm going to write this up in a form where it will be something you can read through and, and that will hopefully be more useful. And I will send it to you or Ronit will send it to you. And I'll also post, post it on my website. So it's there. Uh, and I'm hoping to get that done very soon. So within like the next two weeks. So we have six specific concepts that I'm going to recommend you teach. And the first three are often taught as we teach morphology but maybe not with quite the same angle. So the first one is that words are built from structural units called morphemes, but it's really useful, remember, to say we've got a written morpheme and it's called an element. And I do think it's really important to point out that the word sum is essential for verifying the structures in written words, because sometimes we'll look at a, a word and think, I wonder if that's, I wonder if this is the suffix or that's the suffix. And the word sum allows us to just make sure it works, whatever we're proposing. So the matrix and the word sum are super uh, powerful and you can use any word to show this. You could use cat and cats, help, helps, helpful, helpfulness, and show how we start building words. 
you don't have to, you could do this with kids who aren't even at the point of being able to write or spell these words. You could have matrices on the wall. Maybe you choose a couple particularly useful ones, And when you start working on reading and spelling, um, you know, cap, you can say, oh, look, we have caps up there. That's the S we're going to use that. And notice we also use that with bags. Mm -hmm. So bags, caps, but look, there's an S in both because we spell these things the same and on you go with your lesson. And you've just begun to introduce the idea and get kids thinking that way. The second point is that every word includes at least one base element, could be free, could be bound, and many words include affixes. So that's pretty, pretty basic. We end up teaching that right away with morphology. Uh, and by the way, this is also going to be available um, online. So you're going to get the recording so you can take screenshots. I see someone taking a photo and hopefully you'll be able to take screenshots soon. Um, so English, the third one then is that English has three suffixing conventions for synthesizing written words. And the thing that I think is really important to emphasize is these work every time. And we often use them more than once in constructing a long word. So I'm just going to quickly remind you of what these are, or if you haven't seen them before, you can kind of see how they work. So the E convention just says that when we add a vowel suffix, a suffix that begins with a vowel, we're adding it to a base or a stem, could be just a base, could be a more com long word, um, it could be adding it to a base, could be adding it to a suffix that ends in an E, we're going to replace that unpronounced E with the vowel suffix that follows. And the doubling convention, when we have a, a word that ends in a single consonant preceded by a single vowel and the stress is right there, and we're adding a vowel suffix, starts with a vowel, we're going to double that. So there's a lot of places that you can learn more about these conventions if they're new, but we use these over and over and over again, and everyone who's trying to spell a word should know them. When we add consonant suffixes, suffixes that begin with a consonant, we don't apply either the E convention or the double convention. And then the last one is called the wide I convention. Other people may call these different things. I call them the E, the doubling, and the wide I. So when we have a word that ends in a Y, grapheme, it's not an A, Y, E, Y, U, Y, it's just a Y, and we're adding any sort of suffix, we either vowel or consonant, we change the Y to an I. The only time we don't do that is when we're adding a suffix that begins with an I. Because if we did, we'd end up with two I's in a row and that's not, that doesn't, that's something English avoids. So we have these three conventions. So these then are things that are often talked about when we're introducing morphology, but with a few differences, but they're really important. Written words are built from structural units called elements. We verify them with a word sum. Written words are gonna contain one or more base elements. They can be free, they can be bound, and they may include affixes. And that includes a connecting vowel letter, which is a really important structural element to be familiar with. English has three suffixing conventions for constructing written words, and they work. So we can, if we know the elements, if we know the conventions, we can spell the word. But then there are three more components of morphological awareness as we're talking about written language that I think are equally important. And they're essential for written language, but what's really cool is they're actually easiest to see in written language. So I'm what I'm really doing now is bringing you back to what I've just shared with you and showed you how these illustrate these concepts. So we've seen that the spelling of an element remains the same when affixes are added. So we have that T-E-N-D that's spelled the same, even though when in a tens and in tens, but we're going to see a lot of change in pronunciation of elements. So it's in do and does, it's in probe and probable, steal and stealthy, sight and situate. Now, I like giving examples like this because a lot of times, if we think about probe and probable, we might never have noticed the relationship between them. Why? Because of the pronunciation, because of the meaning, right? But this probe, P-R-O-B, has this idea of try or test. So when you're probing for information, you're kind of trying to get some information, you're testing, is this right? When something is probable, it's it's likely that it will test out to be true, right? Not the meaning of the word, but the deep sense connects them. The pronunciation can throw us off. The meaning difference can, th difference can throw us off. But when we look at the spelling, look, that's the P-R-O-B-E. You place that E with the A-B-L-E and we've got probable. Pronunciation changes. So that's number four. 
Number five is that a base element has an orthographic denotation and a word has a meaning. And this is kind of, I think you've heard me say this over and over because this is one of the main goals of my talk today. I see a lot out there that there's, you know, well, morphology, it's really useful, but it doesn't really work all the time because when you put the morphemes together, you can't add them up and get the meaning. And that comes from thinking about oral morphology, right? If we're thinking about oral morphology and we're thinking about preside and presiding, well, yeah, the meaning of that PR, that preside word stays the same. But we're looking at spelling and we're going down a level. So at this level of the base element, it doesn't have a meaning. And it's really helpful not to try to talk about it. I mean, the same thing is true with prefixes and suffixes. They don't always mean the same thing. They don't always add the same meaning. Sometimes they just intensify the sense of the base. So avoiding the term meaning when you're talking about written morphology is super helpful. Instead, we can say that a base element has an orthographic denotation, a word has a meaning. We could say that a prefix or a suffix adds a certain sense to a word, but it's, it's really helpful to have this distinction. So, and there's a couple subcategories here. Words that share a base, are going to have some connection and meaning and their meaning will connect maybe by a very you know thin little but lovely thread to the orthographic denotation of the base written elements contribute to the meaning of a word but you often can't add them up to get the meaning that doesn't mean that morphology is not working it means that we need to rethink how we're our perspective on written morphology and what's really going on in written morphology and then the last concept is that sometimes two base elements will have the same spelling, but if they have a different orthographic denotation, if they have a different deep sense, then they will be different bases, the homographic bases. Etymology is going to allow us to discern the difference, and it's going to allow us to know which words go with which base. Sometimes we can just kind of tell, but sometimes it's interesting what, as those meanings have shifted, uh, how that might not be quite as clear. All right, so we have additional components of morphological awareness then. I'm just going to review these three that I just presented. The spelling of an element is consistent, but its pronunciation often changes. A base element has an orthographic denotation. A word has a meaning or a definition. We often can't derive a meaning of a word by summing its elements. And often, by the way, words can have more than one usage, more than one definition or meaning, and often all of those will connect back to that orthographic denotation. So it helps us learn multiple meanings of words as well. And a base element is defined by its spelling, but also its orthographic denotation. So now I want to just come back to why we're even here, why all of you are taking time on your Saturday or Sunday, if you're in New Zealand, to sit here and think about spelling and morphology and literacy, because we're here to try to help students. And it's important to come back to what do students need from us? So students with or without dyslexia don't need us to help them process the phonemes in spoken language, unless they have some sort of a speech um, issue that needs to be remediated. They can speak phonemes, they can understand phonemes, they process them, but they often don't have awareness of them because they're kind of this conceptual thing. And so we want to help them understand phonemes and then develop their phonemic awareness and then teach them how phonemes are represented by graphemes in written words, because that's really where we want to go. Exactly the same thing is true of morphological awareness. Students can process morphemes in spoken language. And you'll see a lot of research that talks about how kids develop awareness of morphemes. But remember, morphemes in spoken language might be a little different than the way we're gonna define them for spoken language, or for written language, excuse me. Even in spoken language though, students often lack awareness of the morphemes. And there's research that's been done that shows that students with dyslexia in particular can process morphemes very well, but they often lack even awareness of, of morphemes, even more than students who are non-dyslexic um, will be able to do. So for all students, but particularly our students who struggle, we have to develop their morphological, morphological awareness and then teach them how morphemes are represented in written words. And again, remember, it's so much easier to do this when we look at it in written language, because we're going to have consistent spelling, 
as opposed to changing pronunciation. We're going to have a way to put those together where it's logical, it's coherent. We use three processes that happen over and over again, and this is going to make so much sense to students. So what I'm going to encourage you to do, you may already be doing this, but I'm. this is my call for today, is working on developing morphological awareness, developing morphemic knowledge as well, but recognizing those are two separate things. But do it focusing on written language. So you can start with introducing these concepts that I've just shared with you and that I will write up and send out to you as well. So we have a little more explanation of them than just what's on the slide. And you can use them, you can illustrate these using whatever words you like, words that you are already in the curriculum you're using, words that you understand and feel comfortable with, uh, but you're going you're gonna to then see them in all kinds of other words, and you can help your students see that connection. And then you will develop your own morphemic knowledge, your knowledge of specific bases, specific elements, specific word families as you go. And I have here K through 12 if you're in the US, if you're in other you know, parts of the world, that's not maybe how you talk about that, but all the way through education. But the truth is, this is a lifelong pursuit. I developed some additional morphemic knowledge as I was putting this talk together. There were things that clicked for me. There were things that I saw for the first time. And I've been doing this for a really long time. So we're going to all continue developing that knowledge as we go. The, the place to start, though, is focusing on that awareness. All right, so we're going to have time for questions, happily, um, but I do want to tell you how you can learn a bit more. So I do have a website, Rudy mentioned it. Um, there is a further resources page with all kinds of things listed, webinars that I've given, including a link to one that I gave for the Northern California branch a while back. I don't remember when that was. I have blog posts. I have other resources. And if you sign up to follow, I will send you um, additional, you know, a link to look at additional things as I put them up there. I promise you, you will not get spammed. Um, there are probably people who signed up for that a year and a half ago and think it didn't work because I don't think I've sent anything out to that mailing list for years. But I do hope to get, I think I did when I published my book. And I did publish this book about a year ago. If that, if you're interested in these concepts, one of the reasons I wrote it was to try to explain these concepts um, in kind of a logical way. And if you go there on the further resources page, you will also see a number of other really wonderful books and resources that people have been putting together to help teachers learn more about all these great concepts. And you can contact me at that website as well. There's a contact link. And now I think we have time for questions. So I'm going to stop. Wow, Sue. <laughs> it is always a pleasure listening to you and learning from you. And um, I, in each time I read your book, it just it takes me deeper. And it's true. We're all on this learning journey. And I have aha moments all the time when the words I've been using my whole life. So <laughs> Thank you. I am a better teacher because of you. And if you have not already purchased the book, um, you know, I highly recommend it. And we have um, a special guest in the audience. We have Gail Venable with us, and she is the author of the other back pocket right in the back pocket words. <laughs> Sometimes um, I can switch things around. Yeah, there's yeah. a link to that book as well on my website. If you go to the further resources, you'll find linked mine and also to Gail's. Really a, a wonderful book too that explains so many. I learned a lot reading that book. So there is, there are some questions in the chat. Let's see. And if you have not yet entered a question in the chat, Go ahead and take a moment and do that, and we will um, go through. Um, and then I, I'll give you. We'll be able to. You'll be able to unmute yourself too um, in a moment. So a few people were. Um, it was in re in regards to using the language orthographic denotation versus yeah. meaning. And again, you know, we're talking to there's a lot of teachers here, you know, there's various grade levels. Um, if you want to go ahead and address that. 
that is, I totally get that's a mouthful. Now, the thing is, a lot of kids get Tyrannosaurus Rex and they're just fine with it, right? Or uh, my my three-year-old could tell me about Diplodocuses before I even knew what that was. So sometimes a big word may feel intimidating to us, but it might not be to kids. But the other thing you can do is you can explain it. You can say, okay, you really want them to just get the idea, right? That the meaning of a word is not the same thing as this deep sense. You can use the term, we've got this echo meaning, or we've got this deep sense, or we've got this you know, I'm sure you can probably even come up with better ways to describe it than I could, but you want to just differentiate. So they're not thinking because a lot of times they will think, well, pre, that means before, and then view, that means view. So preview, okay, that works. But then you get another word where it doesn't seem to work. And you're thinking, I, maybe that's not, maybe I don't have those morphemes right. But so it's just making sure they understand that sometimes it's really close and sometimes it's farther away. So uh, if anyone else has other terms that they use, um, you know, you can put them in the chat too. But I, I think the idea of just, you want to get the concept across, but orthographic denotation after a while, it just sort of trips off your tongue and, you know, you might try it and see what happens. So you are now able to unmute yourself. So if you have a question or you want to speak directly to Sue, if you go ahead and, you know, raise your hand button and then unmute yourself, that's great. So, and I'm seeing a question that came just kind of going through the chat too. Someone, Carrie, um, asked about, first of all, like my Chicago intro, which is great because I wasn't sure how many people would <laughs> would get that but you know I may be dating myself a little bit um but the question is do you recommend we not write meaning word sums where we put the orthographic denotations into a word sum maybe Carrie do you want to unmute and just explain that question a little bit um so like sometimes we'll take the um word sum the the morphemic elements and then make an arrow down to put the definition underneath of those morphemic elements and then use context to um, come up with the, the meaning. So we'll go from the literal to um, the contextual meaning and use that to um, come up with that, that meaning that is, is the true meaning in context. And I, I, um, I wanna be somebody who um, brings order to the chaos. So if we're all doing it in our respective um, you know, little empires of um, how we handle these things. And it, it gets confusing for the masses. And so I just, I really appreciate what you're saying. And I just want to, you know, see what your thought is about that. You know, the, if you want to, if you want to basically write down the orthographic denotation so kids can be seeing it and thinking about it, that one way would be just have the matrix right next to it. So you're kind of connecting it back to it written in the matrix where it's like, okay, it's part of the base. The other thing would be maybe you can find a way to, you know, get creative where it's like little dots and dashes in the arrows or something instead of a direct line it's you know it's a curly cue or something just to keep kids thinking about how words evolve or meanings evolve and the meaning may be quite different than that deep sense but you can kind of still follow the thread back it might even be fun to have some words where you're like oh that's a kind of a direct thread and that one kind of wound around like that. so um maybe I like that, that. helpful <laughs> okay so someone wrote, some highly regarded intervention programs have students practice pronouncing and defining affixes in isolation, but as you pointed out, pronunciation and meaning carry very, can vary depending on the word. Do you see any value in having students practice these skills in isolation for the most common pronunciation meaning perhaps, or just include study of isolated affixes that remain more consistent? So, you know, I mean, there's, I, I've always felt that there are, all of these practices do have some value. What you do, what you want to do is avoid setting expectations that it always works this way. So if you've got a PRE and you're having them pronounce it as pre or pro, you know, that could be something that's useful, but then immediately start looking at examples, I think, where you want to see how that's actually going to show up. Um, because sometimes the pronunciation is even different. Like I've I've had kids learn pre and pr or pr 
but the, you know, but then it shows up in president, it, it feels totally different. So I'm not sure I, if you're trying to get kids to pronounce words that can be helpful, but there are probably other ways that are going to be even a little bit more effective. But, you know, I mean, I, I don't, don't throw it out until you've figured out how you're going to help kids learn and understand that variability in another way. But I think we want to do it in a way that we don't set expectations that the system's not going to match because that's when kids go, you know, I can't understand. It doesn't make any sense anyway. So, um, oh, someone pointed out that pre uh, prefixes can be homographic. They can look the same, but don't mean the same. Their origin and meaning determine their identity. Okay, yeah, so th that's very interesting. I appreciate that. Um, suggestions for resources to build up an intentional list and resources to look up a word on the spot. Well, that is a great question, but it is a sort of a second the idea of how to look up a word is a process. I, I, if you're interested in learning more, Pete Bowers does an approach called structured word inquiry, and he's very much focused on kind of inquiry-based teaching. That process as a, as a teacher, as a tutor, is a fabulous way to learn more about words yourself. And you may, can then decide how you want to bring that into your instruction with students. So you could take a look at some of the stuff that Pete Bowers is doing. There are a lot of resources that I've listed on my website where people have put together uh, you know, specific uh, words that are already analyzed, like Gail's book is there, and there are some people that have done a great, um, a great um, resource called the High Frequency Word Project, where they put together a lot of high frequency words and done some analysis of those. I highly recommend that. Um, Sue, so, can I interject? So, um, certainly, um, the etym online, I'm not sure if it's come up during this presentation, but it's a great resource that you can talk about. And I uh, there's also now an app. So it's on my phone. So like I can like really just like quickly if I need an, uh, an, a resource um, immediately and I'm in the moment in the classroom. Will you want to just say a couple words about um, etym online? Adam Online is a fabulous resource. It's put together by a guy named Doug Harper, and he's got, if you, many of you have probably seen it, but it, you go there and you put in a word. So maybe you'd put in subside, and it would tell you the etymology of it, show you what, how, how it came into English and where it came from. So that, if the way I knew that subside is related to dissident is they both go back to Latin sedere, and that's there in Adam Online. Now, there's a little bit of a challenge sometimes to reading that because, um, not the way Doug did this in order to make it efficient is that sometimes entries go through multiple entries. So maybe subside might take you to an entry that then takes you on. And if you do have my book in the appendix, there's kind of a walk through at them online and how to use it. Um, but it is a fabulous resource. The thing is, there's a lot of information in there that you kind of have to interpret. And so sometimes people get a little bit, um, you know, you can get sidetracked. It's also very easy to go down rabbit holes, but it is in, indeed a fabulous resource and really helps understand. That's where you can kind of sort a lot of this out. Someone is saying they took a webinar from Pete um, and that was helpful. Great. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that. Um, I can't remember. Oh, someone asked a question about, do you suggest having a specific morphology time each day? Um, I get that you can incorporate it into vocabulary, but there may not be any morphological words in a reading vocabulary selection, for example. I would challenge you to find a vo reading vocabulary selection that doesn't have at least one morphologically complex word. I would be very interested to see if such a thing exists. I often go to literally a first grade, you know, example of a reading curriculum and they'll have they'll have the spelling words and they'll have the focus the, the phonics focus and they'll have maybe some vocabulary words for, that are kind of spoken vocabulary and they'll have some that are in the in the text and I can always find something that I can work with so I do think that you could do a separate morphology time and maybe that would be you know kind of fun but everybody's limited in time, right? You only have so much time to work with your students. So it's really nice if you can find a way to bring it into what you're already doing. But if, you're, if your spelling list, for example, has a couple of irregular words on it, those are often a great place to start because those are often e explained either by morphology or by something to do with their history, their etymology. 
And so as you look at, you know, ahead for the next few months, you might say, oh, here I can do this and here I can do that. And you can kind of bring it all together. But it's great if you have time to do a specific morphology lesson. All right. I don't... <laughs> Sue, <laughs> it is such a privilege. I'm so happy you were able to join us again today, and maybe we'll be able to plan another um, <laughs> another one in this series as we all continue to expand our knowledge. And it's very powerful for students to understand that it's not um, our language is not about translating. Um, you know, speech sounds that it's morphophonemic and it's just powerful. And um, I'm a better teacher because of you. Clearly those speech sounds are there in the spelling of so many words, right? Sit and lunch and send and shrimp, and we can do that. But if we don't bring in the morphology, it starts to fall apart pretty quickly. And it's part of, it's part of the whole thing from the very beginning, because a lot of those words where the, the relationships are super um, consistent, they're base elements often. So that's where we're going to find a lot of that consistency. So, but I appreciate Ronit, all you said, and I'll stop talking. This is so powerful. Again, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. So this will conclude our event. I will be sending out Sue's PDF and a copy of the recording. Thank you again all for joining us this morning. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you all. Do you need to stop the recording, Renee? Thank you.